What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Live Different Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Wilson, and today we are here with Ryan Fisher. Ryan is from CrossFit Chalk. He has a uh, gym out there in California that he has now scaled. He does programming in tons of gyms uh, all across the country, if not the world. Uh, you can hear him, of course, on his podcast, Real Chalk. And uh, honestly, I'm just excited to to jam. I know that you are a very competitive athlete, that you've finished top five in CrossFit regionals, top 20 in the world in the CrossFit Open for the past three years. And uh, yeah, you have a lot going from, from of course, the, the nerdy biohacking stuff. And, and I say nerdy because, yes, I am. Uh, I like to geek out on the, the science personally, um, but also just... If you hear the word biohack, I feel like people instantly think you're a nerd. I, 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 I'm I cool with owning it. You know, it's uh, that's okay with me. Uh, but just, I want to get actionable stuff, how people can improve their health, uh, become more fit, and talk about your startup story. And of course, you're an avid traveler too. So anyway, Ryan, enough with the intro. Uh, your body of work speaks for itself. How you doing? I'm good. Um, yeah, there's a lot going on in my life. I'm one of those people that people always come up to me and they're like, dude, I just love following you because you just do so many things. <laughs> But uh, I think I've just always kind of been that way. I've just always liked to do as many things as I can. As, as I can. And I'm probably 50% of the time you see me, I'm kind of stressed out. The other 50%, I'm like really chill and mellow. It just kind of just depends on when you catch me throughout the day, I guess. Yeah. How, how do you do it? It's crazy. So like I didn't even really understand where my life was going to go in the beginning. I uh, My actual – true story like the whole thing how it all started up is is as is an amazing story actually i went from moving from utah i was on the i was on the olympic team for bobsled in 2010 and uh, i just graduated to college with a exercise physiology degree and i moved out to coach at this gym in san diego wound up quitting that job and was like i hate working here so i just quit like on the spot i didn't really think about it i was like i hate this you know told the owner like fuck you basically I'm out of here and I uh, didn't really think about that I probably should have <laughs> <laughs> and about six months later I couldn't find a job and I quickly realized that I had made a mistake and I had no money left at all I had like 200 bucks and someone at the gym that I was working at before I quit was like you know you can stay with me on my couch for like as long as you need until you can get everything together and I had to say yes, basically. And I stayed with this girl for about five months. Five months on a couch of someone I didn't even know. Wow. And, and during that time, I was like stealing food and just like I was just a shitty human. And then uh, I went to this huge competition that was like, the, like just as big as the CrossFit Games. Like all the best athletes in the world were there. And I got second place. And it just – uh catapulted my name from like no one to just like this insane person in the crossfit world and i think it was cool because of how like poor and how like bad my situation was it just like seriously catapulted me in such a crazy way and because of that i wound up getting like a couple different jobs as a trainer i started saving my money and i met i just i met a client one day that really wanted to help me open my own gym and that was never anything i wanted to do there was so many of them around, and I wound up opening my gym in Orange County, which is probably per capita. Like we had more gyms in our area than anyone else in the world. Wow! And we had like 14 gyms within like a 10 mile radius, if that. And it was just it just seemed like madness to kind of open one, but I was like, well, you know what? I'm not gonna just do it different. It's gonna look different. Everything about it's gonna be different. Like programming is gonna be different. Um, I know a lot of people are like, you know, you can do it it's going to be good because it's you, you know, and it's like, it's not just because it's me. A lot of people are going to walk in. They're not going to know who I am. So I came out and made this gym. That's like a million dollars. So I had a lot of money to spend from my investor and I just went with spending as much, much of it as I could. <laughs> Cause I had never walked in a CrossFit gym that looked like a million dollars. They always looked like this cheap kind of dungeness thing. Sure. So now when you walk into my place, you're like, wow, this place is really, really cool. And like within my first year, I had 300 members, which is completely unheard of. And 
there was one more thing that I think that just helped make the whole thing more successful was in the beginning, everybody was opening gyms and they would put all of their programming on their website and you could see what they were doing every day. So you can kind of, you know, figure out which gym you wanted to go to because you're like, oh, this programming looks good. I don't really like that one. Like they're too strength biased. They're too conditioning biased, whatever. I never did that. I never thought it was a good idea to put my workouts on the website. And because we were so popular and like we were growing on social media and like everybody just kind of wanted to know what we were doing behind those walls. People would call and be like, oh, what's your workout today? Like maybe I'll come by. And I'm like, the only way you're getting this workout is if you come in. <laughs> And then like four four years of that went by and somebody one day who traveled a lot, like they kept coming to the gym like every couple months and they're like, man, you should put these workouts online. These are awesome workouts. So I was like, all right, maybe I'll try it. And I put them on and like within my first month, I had made as much money with the online programming as I was making in the gym. Damn. <laughs> within the first month. And then within a year, like now it's almost – equivalent to like if I opened like, you know, a couple more locations and wow. it's a, uh, it's a lot less work than, than running one location. I can tell you that. Sure. Sure. Especially for shifting from brick and brick and mortar to yeah. online. The amount of work that that gym, even still to this day consumes of my time is insane. It's, it's a lot of work. And I think a lot of people are, they massively underestimate how much work it's going to be. Yeah, I can I, I can totally imagine it. No, it's interesting. Uh, I know that you're doing, uh, or your podcast is with Shrugged Collective, and uh, I've listened to Barbell Shrugged for a while. I mean, not religiously, but I, I like to tune in every so often. And um, I know that's how they started as gym owners, right? Yeah, they did, and uh, that was, that was another amazing lucky situation for me too. <laughs> I just uh, I started a podcast. And I called it Real Chalk, you know, to kind of spin off the gym. And it was basically all the questions that people would ask me in the gym. And as a gym owner in the beginning, I didn't really have a lot of time to want to sit down and talk to everybody. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to do a whole one on nutrition. Sure. I'm going to do a whole one on programming. I'm going to do like all these questions that people ask me all the time. I'm just going to answer them and put them on a podcast. And then they, my podcast started blowing up really big because I kind of have an interesting mouth and I curse and <laughs> I'm pretty – uh pretty out there for some people, I guess. <clears throat> so uh, I guess people just really liked it. And they hit me up one day like, hey, you want to be part of our of our podcast collective? And I was like, <laughs> of course. Like you guys are like the biggest podcast in the world for strength and conditioning. So uh, I did that. And the only thing I don't love about that, because now it went from being fun doing podcasts to a little bit more stressful. Sure. Cause I used to be able to do a podcast like whenever I wanted, like once every three weeks, once a month, like maybe two months ago by and I don't make one. Like I would really prepare, you know, like just for one talk and now I have to do one every week and it's a little bit harder. So, uh, add a little bit more to the plate, made life a little more stressful, <clears throat> but it is still really fun. And I get to meet people all the time that I would never have met if it wasn't for the podcast. No, that's, that's awesome. And I mean, it, it, it it's basically a, a podcast network and then they're able to uh, bring in advertisers and, and stuff like that. And, and of course help promote, uh, promote your podcast to their listener base. Is that the basics of it? Yeah. So because they have so many, um, so many different episodes now, there's a, there's a different episode every single day versus, you know, once a week. Sure. They're able to get a lot more downloads They're able to get a lot more sponsors. So it kind of works well for everybody. So I went from, you know, a couple thousand listeners to all of a sudden like a half a million downloads like instantly. Damn. Like within like a month. I mean like I, sometimes you get like a million in a month. Wow. It's an insane amount of people that are all, you know, part of it. Yeah, that's that's great. I, I saw a couple familiar faces. Um on there, Joe Di has. Been, I've talked to him a bunch uh, here on, <laughs> uh, on this podcast. Would you say he's a big time biohacker? So if you're into that, he's the man. Yeah, yeah. We geeked out for a little while, um, and then had the opportunity to. Uh, I'm here in Austin, so I, I work out at on it, and I've uh, had the opportunity to work out a couple times with uh, Eric from I don't know how you say his last last name, but Primal Soldier. 
So yep. I see, yeah, I saw some familiar names. So that was pretty cool. Um, Eric Leja. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, and then I heard, uh, actually, it's funny. So Donnie, uh, Donnie Gallegos, um, he is who put us in contact. And I know you guys are both down there in, in Newport Beach. Of course, he runs our, our custom experiences and he's been on on the podcast here and we're always he's in austin right now actually we went and uh yeah just geeked out for a little while just not even we didn't even work out we just rolled around on i don't know foam rollers or or whatever we were doing but um his wife kate works out at your gym uh, yes good morning yeah so anyway pretty uh pretty cool to see and then i so oh yeah so that was the story so donnie told me oh yeah you know uh might be interested in running a trip with Ryan, uh, blah, blah, blah. And then I thought, oh, okay, cool. And then I, I listened into a episode, random episode of, of Barbell Shrugged and it was you and uh, and Mike Bledsoe and I don't know who else, but I was like, oh shit, okay, yeah, comes comes full circle. So uh, anyway, yeah, I see your name popping up all over the place now. Yeah, I mean, if it's fitness related and it's in CrossFit, you're definitely going to hear my name at some point. No, that's that's great. That's great. So, okay, I, I want to know um, how you were able to perform athletically at that level of someone who was, I mean, stealing food, as you say, right? You just, I mean, yeah. obviously you were an Olympic athlete before, so I am. Yeah. I assume that you were in pretty damn good shape uh but now your your habits and your training patterns have probably completely shifted now is, is that right oh yeah everything's different now i um i don't have like a schedule per se like when i'm gonna work out i just i get as much work done as i can for the day i'm one of those people like if i a lot of people can't really work unless they get a good workout in I'm I'm the opposite. Like I can't really work out unless I get stuff done because I'll just be thinking about it the whole time. Sure. So sometimes like yesterday, for instance, I woke up at four in the morning. I I uh I coached five classes from five AM all the way to one PM. I got all my work done from like one to seven PM. Damn. And then I worked out at like eight eight PM. And I was completely wrecked. And I was like hating every second of it, but it was the only way I was going to get it done. So, I mean, that sucks. And then like, I, I, at the moment I try to keep like aesthetics, like number one for me, like if I'm going to be posting workouts and I want people to follow my stuff, I better at least look good. Sure. So the, the performance for me is like way lower now. Like if I perform great, then, you know, awesome. If not, I don't really care anymore. Sure. Okay. So I, you, I do, but I don't. You, you're, you've obviously got a lot on your plate. You're trying to perform as an athlete. You're trying to run this business. I mean, when you said 4 a.m., that was the first thing you said, and I, I cringed, of course. Uh, and, it hurts. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then aesthetics usually frequently are the actually the opposite of health, right? So are you concerned with burning yourself out? Um. I'm at, I at least have the burnout feeling once a week. Okay. <laughs> I'm definitely feeling it for sure. Right. Um, but I also have like this incredible motivation for myself where like this is what I do and this is who I am and sure people look up to me for this. So, you know, if you're going to do this, do it hard, do it well, do it the best you can. So even yesterday I was feeling like shit and I just was like, well, this is – this is what I get to call work every day. So right. just do it and yeah. like, and, and be thankful for it. So I, I try to stick those things in my head. I feel like this whole biohacking thing is like a new thing that everyone's been kind of hearing about. And I think it's more than just like simple things like getting more sunlight or, you know, grounding yourself in the ground and like the weird hippie things that everybody thinks that it is. It also has like a lot of just like basic things that we need to do on a regular basis, like being grateful for what you do and having like that gratitude in your life. Sure. And I don't even know like if it was ever even cool to talk about. Like, could you imagine telling someone like, you know, it's a really good idea to, you know, write some things down that you're grateful for every night or something like that. And you'd be like, dude, you're such a nerd. And like, I don't even want to talk to you anymore. <laughs> like, sure. Like you would think that, that person's so strange, but now because 
all of these things are kind of going on with the biohacking industry. It makes it a cool thing. And um, I, for one, you know, being a podcaster and listening to other people like Joe Dean, um, I've had – have you had the Primal Hacker on your show? Uh, no, but uh, remind remind me who – I think his Instagram is Primal Hacker, but he's the most intense biohacking guy I've ever listened to. Wow. And yeah. I have an episode. I have an episode on Real Chalk that you should listen to. He talks about like he has magnets under his bed. Okay. He wears he wears like the blue blocker glasses. Sure. He's, his entire house is all red lights. I mean, he takes it to the full extreme. Sure. And I mean, I wouldn't want that to be my life, but it's just interesting to hear all the things that he's doing. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, getting it like Ben Greenfield, uh, all these people who are like super super into it and. If you just take 10% of what they do, I feel like it can change your life a little bit. Of course, of course. And, and, you know, I struggle with the biohacker name. A lot of it, first of all, is common sense. Uh, second of all, it, it's no hip new age industry. Uh, most of it, it's like what yogis have been doing for thousands of years. Uh, well, CrossFit, nothing either. CrossFit sure. high intensity interval training that's been around forever. Sure. And they just put a name on it. So like, but because there's a name on it, it like defines what you need to do, right? So for you to be like a successful CrossFitter, you need to do these movements in this time domain and now it's CrossFit. So now like if you go outside and you get this much sunlight and you get grounded and you do this and you do that, now you're a biohacker, right? Right. Everybody needs to fit in a box somewhere. And that's it. where I struggle a little bit. Like uh, people ask me, somebody asked me, Hey, so CrossFit, what are your opinions? Uh, is it a cult? And I was like, look, I'm, I've never been a member of a, a CrossFit gym, but we've done a lot of CrossFit trips. Uh, I went in and got the level one certification just out of interest. But the, really, the community is what's so cool about it. And yeah, sure, if you're going to drink the Kool-Aid and not take your rest days and uh, get... Uh, What's rhabdo, right? Where you, yeah. you, you're, I don't even know how to explain it, but you're, you're basically, your body seizes up because you worked out so hard. Um, I mean, yeah, okay. My, might sound a little cultish and same with the biohacking. You're talking about, oh, magnets under your bed or whatever. And, and I get it. It's just someone trying to replace how, oh yeah, humans used to sleep on the ground where they were in contact with the ma magnetic pull of the earth or whatever but um yeah. but yeah what do, what do you think about everybody trying to find their kind of their tribe right like oh either you're a yogi or you're a biohacker or you're a crossfitter or well i mean nothing's really fun in life without someone to share it with right sure it doesn't matter if it's a girlfriend or family or success i mean shit sometimes like i'm I'm so stoked on all my success and I'm like, I, I look back and I'm like, damn, well, I didn't like do anything like with anyone for like a month, you know, like I, I really wish I had someone to go on my bike rides with or like whatever. So, right. I mean, imagine doing all that and going to the gym by yourself and like doing this by yourself and that by yourself. Then all of a sudden CrossFit sounds a lot more appealing, right? Cause you're like, you get to do it with other people or like, you know, maybe you have like a, a weekly biohacking retreat that you go to with friends and you guys all do a bunch of weird shit outside. <laughs> of like it's like a, like a Wim Hof experience or something, you know, and you guys are all in the cold tub and you get out and do some weird stuff, but like you're super stoked on it and you probably look forward to it all week. Yeah. So, hell yeah. I think if it gets you out of bed in the morning and gets you excited, uh, it's something to look forward to. I think everyone should be part of some sort of cult. No, that's that, that's a good way. Uh, that's a good way to put it. You said you love to do things on your own uh, by yourself, but you also like to share with other people. Um, yeah, tell me about traveling because I know you recently. I think you were in uh, in Switzerland and you just went out there and just kind of just did it on the on the back of a napkin or just showed <laughs> up and decided, all right, I'm going to go here tonight and checked in yeah. the hotel and said, all right, here's this crazy hike. I'm going to go do this. And, uh, yeah, t I don't know. Tell me a little bit about your trip or your travel so, style. It's interesting because I had never traveled growing up. Like we, my mom was afraid to fly. I didn't have a dad growing up. And, um, 
the only thing that we would do, because I'm from the East Coast, from New Jersey, the only thing we would do is we would take cruise ships out of New York, and the closest places to go were like the Bahamas and the Virgin Islands and stuff like that. Sure. Or we, or we would drive down to Florida and then do like the same thing. So my entire childhood was cruise ships. I'd never been on a plane. I'd never done like any sort of real traveling. And then um, I opened the gym, obviously. And like during that time, I wasn't really doing a lot of like much of anything, nor did I have money to do anything. And then the only thing, the only thing I had done by the time I went on my first trip was when I was sponsored through all like when at the height of my career, I had gone to Dubai a few times. Uh, for some world championship CrossFit events, and I had gone to school in Hawaii at a college. So that's like all I'd ever really gone to was Hawaii and Dubai, <laughs> and then like a bunch of states, you know, for for competing. Yeah, yeah. Never like been to Europe or like been to Asia or I hell I didn't even go to Canada and it was like right above us. But as soon as I got enough time and money and like all these things, I was like going on Instagram and I'd go to like, I didn't realize this, but you can go to a country's Instagram. Sure. Like if you go to Norway, you just type in visit Norway and it's like, you know, you see the little blue check mark and you're like, all right, cool. So you look there and you start looking at all the, all the cool things that they post on their Instagram. So I started doing that. So basically the, I knew what I was interested in was mountains. That was the first thing I was like, all right, well, if I'm going to travel, I want to see some cool mountains. So I instantly started looking up, you know, what are the biggest ones that I could climb? And Norway kept popping up, like all these hikes in Norway. And I was like, damn, these looks ama- this looks amazing. So I just, I drew up a map and I just put dots on like where I wanted to go in Norway. And I bought a one-way ticket <laughs> to Norway because I didn't know like when I was going to leave, where I was going to leave from. And I got one night hotel. So I got there, got my first night hotel, uh, went the next day, did the hike that I really wanted to do. It's called Prekestolen or Pulpit Rock. It's like one of the most famous hikes in the world. And then I was like, all right, cool. I had no hotel, <laughs> went to the next place. Uh, like I drove there in a car, just sat there on my phone on booking.com and looked up the next place to stay, got another place, did another hike. Before I knew it, I was in Italy doing all the same things. And then from Italy, I went to Iceland and just all one way tickets. Nice. And I, I, I really just like deciphered where I was going to go off of how cheap the ticket was going to be. So sure. I could have, you know, I really wanted to go to like Amsterdam or one of these other cool places at the time. But wow, airlines had these crazy deals going on where it was really cheap to go to Iceland. And I was like, all right, well, cool. Let's just go and check it out. And same thing, I, you know, I'd go out there, no place to stay. And then just kind of like figure out the town and see like where I wanted to stay. So that's kind of like the way that I've just been doing it. Um, I get one way tickets and then I, you know, I land and I figure out the town. Like a few times I've bought hotel rooms and tried to see if that worked out. But I'd always get it like in a part of town that like, you know, wasn't like ideal or I would always mess it up that way. Or I'd stay somewhere and be like, oh, it would have been so much cooler if I stayed there. So now I just land. I walk around. I don't bring too much, just a backpack and like a little gym bag. And it's not super uncomfortable to have my stuff with me. So I'll look around. I'm like, all right, this place looks cool and I'll stay there. And then then, um, I go on Instagram, look up the coolest photos I can find. I bookmark them and I put them on a map and I just figure out how to get there. And I think it's honestly my favorite part of traveling is figuring out how I'm going to get there. Had I had that all mapped out, I would think I would hate it. That's funny. especially like if I knew I had to be somewhere by like Wednesday or something, right? Like what if I like where I'm at so much, I want to stay an extra day, which happens all the time. Totally agree. Then you're on the phone all day. Like you got to change the hotel. You got to change the rental car. The, maybe you got to change a flight cause you're going to go somewhere else. Like forget that. I hate it. <laughs> just the whole thought of it. Just, I hate it. No, that that's awesome. I mean, I, I just got back from uh, Thailand and Bali and yeah, I went on a one way and decided, okay, I have a rough idea of what I would like to do, but I don't want to be tied to somebody else's schedule and and um, have to go back when so just because I bought a ticket. So I try to keep it as open ended as 
as possible. And yeah, sure, I might know I want to go to places A, B, and C, but in between, oh, if that's cool, yeah, I like to, yeah. I like to stay. Um, and my plans changed a few times while I was over there, but just got to fully take advantage of the places that I liked and then places that I didn't like so much. Okay, yeah, you can you can move on. And uh, But so many people are terrified of this style of travel. And I think that really tests people because just like that amazing race style, right? One time I went from uh, Costa Rica to Mexico through uh, Nicaragua, Honduras, Guatemala, um, Belize, and then up to like Tulum and flew out of, uh, flew out of Cancun. But I just did it on buses and like purposely had no plan just showed up in a place and said all right how do i get to this next destination and it was eye opening for me but that whole, that that terrifies most people what would you tell those people um i mean some of the best experiences i've had on my travel travels are usually the most random moments and i'm always by myself so like i'll go on a trip with someone and things don't work out the same. Like I'm not doing something that they want to do or like maybe you're doing something that they really want to do um, and you're just waiting for that to be over so you can go do what you want to do. Um, so that's why I'm a huge fan of going by, by yourself on like big trips. I absolutely love it. Um, and then secondly, yeah, like when you meet up with just random people and do the most random things, those are like the best moments. And a lot of the times, the things that you didn't even plan on doing – wind up being the best things of the whole trip. Sure. And I just feel like that's like so important to experience and be able to talk to random people, you know, and like, like the last trip that I just went on, I went to Switzerland. You saw, I went to Switzerland, Amsterdam, France, hmm, and Iceland. Yeah. I went to Iceland again. So this trip in particular, I brought my stepdad with me. Because uh, he has never traveled ever. And wow. I just thought – so I, I paid for the whole trip. I thought it would be something cool to like do with him before he doesn't really want to travel anymore. I made mm -hmm. the same deal with my mom, but she hasn't taken me up on it yet. <laughs> but uh, my goal was to just show him so much of the world and have him like really experience it and, and get excited to watch him experience it. You know, So every time we'd like sit down at like a dinner or wherever we were – um, I would just start sparking up conversation with random people next to us, start asking them like what they've been doing all day and like whatever. And my dad like would get all nervous, like, Oh my God, like, you don't even know them. And I'm like, what's well, fine. Like, and then by the end of the trip, he was like, dude, I can't believe like, just like the way you talk to people and like how you think everything's just going to be fine. Like I was stressing out the whole time because we never had a place to stay. We never had like, you know, any like real plans. But I'd wake up every morning and I'd, I'd be like, oh, we're going to be good. Like, trust me, we're just going to walk this direction and everything's going to be fun. <laughs> yeah, that's that's awesome. That's awesome. Hey, have you always – I mean, you just told me that you stayed on a, a neighbor or a, a stranger's couch for five months and, you know, scrounged for food. Have you always been able just to uh, engage with strangers and are – you don't seem shy. No, definitely not. Um, I've always had this feeling that like everything happens for a reason and I always feel like if you're being the best version of yourself that you can at the time, then good things will work out and good things will happen. It's really hard to be really passionate and motivated whether or not you have money or not. But like people know that like you are, you know, people can tell like who you are like very easily I feel like. Um, and I've always been super passionate about fitness and at the time CrossFit when I didn't have anything and people knew it like right away. I've had so many people write me letters who knew me before I was successful and they'd always say like, I always knew you were going to be um, like from the first time I met you and I think that those traits like people could pick up on and there's no reason to really stress out about it. Like if you know deep down inside everything's going to work out. So I always just felt like it was going to work out. So I know sure. not everyone feels that way. Some other people have, you know, the half the glass is half empty type of a uh, thing. So maybe they're like, oh, nothing's gonna work out. And if you think that way, I think then maybe nothing will work out. <laughs> yeah. What, what What would you tell those people? Oh, that's a hard one. So I feel like 
think just think of the alternative, right? Like like you were asking me, how do you stay motivated like when you're working out and you don't want to? And I'm saying, well, this is my job and this is what I get to do every day. Right. What if I was like working the night shift at like Target or something? And I was like, I really wanted to do something else. But I just kept thinking that this is my life and that's it. Then you're going to be stuck with that. I mean, it can't get if your life sucks already. Not doesn't doesn't suck, but you're not you're living you're not living your best life. It's not going to get that much worse, really, if you start trying something better, right? If you already think that it sucks, right? Go for it, <laughs> right? You 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 don't have anything to lose. Yeah, you might as well, especially if you have something that's not really like a hard thing to obtain. Like if you have a job right now that's not a hard job to obtain, and you leave to try something else, and you have to come back, so be it. Sure. Yeah, you're always going to regret what you didn't try, not what you didn't succeed on. Right, right, yes, at, at the end of the day. Um, you, you said something interesting before that if you are – I forget how, how exactly you put it, but basically if you're putting out the best intentions, then things are going to work out in your favor. So if you come across you're a strain – Yes, Uh how did you, how did, have you always been that way? Because when you expressed that earlier in your life, well, things weren't going your way and uh, you weren't living your best life and you weren't, uh, maybe your values weren't aligned with who exactly you were, so uh, who, who you are inside. So I, I'm curious how you kind of harness that. Yeah, so I feel like most people at some point in their life don't know what they really want to do, and that's fine. Um, and I remember my mom really stressing me out during that time because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And she was like, I really want you to go back to school, you know, like you already lost everything, and, you know, it'd be nice if you had a job in healthcare or something safe, you know. And I, and I, and I thought about it. I'm like, man, she's right, but – I really like this CrossFit thing and I really like working out and like, I don't know where it's going to go, but in my mind, I was like, I am the best CrossFitter in the world. Like I, I wasn't huge on social media or I wasn't going to the big competitions because mainly because I didn't have time or the money for it. Uh, well, I guess I had all the time, but like to spend, spend the money to go, you know, do these things mainly, I guess. And, uh, I was like, if I ever get a chance to meet these guys or work out with these guys, I'm going to, I'm going to win. And like, I, I just knew it. I don't know. I just, I knew and I went to a competition and I did win and my life changed, but not everyone has those chances. Not everyone has those same circumstances, I guess, but shit, I don't know. I, I feel very, very lucky for so many things that happened to me and like, and the way that they happened and just like the order that they happened in very, very incredibly lucky, but I had an incredible amount of trust in myself and things easily could have went the wrong way. Sure. In which case I don't know how I would handle it because it's, it's so hard to think about. Yeah. Tell, tell, tell me about maybe some, more difficult times or, uh, Oh man, I got some good ones. For yeah. You. Cause I mean, I'm sure it's not like, Oh yeah, everything, I just knew it. Everything just kind of worked out. I'm sure it was a tough road. Yeah. So when I didn't have anything, I would just be working out at the gym, like as much as I could, you know, training for whatever. There'd be like free competitions online that I could sign up for just to kind of get my name out there. I, you know, I was already applying to like, 20 different jobs a day, every day online. The gym that I was working out at, um, the, it was called CrossFit PB, and one of the owners, his name is Anders Varner, and now he's the host of Barbell Shrugged. That's kind of another reason why I'm on Barbell Shrugged. Um, and he'd always just be like, dude, just like stop working out. Just like <laughs> go do anything else. But I'm like, I don't have anything to do. You know, I didn't have anything. <laughs> So um, what wound up happening was one day I was working out and this guy walked by the front of the gym and he's, he's, he's – anyone who follows me on social media, you can tell I have like really gnarly like abs. I mean I have a, you know, a pretty ridiculous body in, in the CrossFit world. So this guy walked by and he's like, 
you would be like an amazing, you know, like stripper. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm like, well, I would never want to do that, but I don't have any money right now, so I'm very interested. So <laughs> this guy gives me his card and starts telling me like, you know, about the whole stripper thing and how much money I can make. I guess he owns a, he owns this bar. So he's like, you know, you gotta take this card, come to my office. We'll talk, like we'll show, I'll show you some things or whatever. And I'm like, all right. He'll, he'll show you some things. Huh? <laughs> Here's where it gets really weird. So I basically, I go to his office like the next day. When I get there, he's dressed up as a woman. So he's a drag queen. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, this got really, really strange. So he brings me in and he's like, well, I'm going to show you some like routines that you need to learn. So like when you go on stage or whatever, right, that you know what you're doing. So this, this had to go on for like a few weeks. I had to go there like on the weekends and he'd show me some stuff. But basically I'm like doing like a lap dance on this drag queen basically. He's like showing me like how to do these things. I'm doing all these provocative dances and like learning how to just be completely ridiculous. And all of it's for a gay bar, not a straight bar. Wow. Did you know this at the time? Um, Sort of. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It was a few hundred bucks a night. So I was like, I got it. This is, I really needed it. Yeah. So uh, during this time, there's also the qualifications for the OC Throwdown, which is the second biggest event in the world for CrossFit. So some people in the gym had signed me up. I did the events. I got second place in the online qualifier to go to the big competition. And the owner of the big competition calls me and he says, you know, I saw you did so well in the online competition. Like the whole world wants to see you compete and like we got to have you. But I keep noticing that you're not signing up. And I'm like, well, yeah, to go to your competition is $200 and it's, it's actually all the money I have. And he's like, you don't have any sponsors or anything? I'm like, no, 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 no. Like you don't understand. Like I'm, I'm like homeless. Like I have nothing, you know, like in all the videos that I was submitting, I wasn't even wearing shoes. Like I'm doing all these workouts barefoot not as like a joke or because I liked barefoot. I only had one pair of shoes and I didn't want to ruin them. Holy <laughs> shit. So I, uh, he, or, or he says to me, you know, well, what if I knock it down to like 50% and you just give me like a hundred bucks. And I was like, dude, none of this is a joke. Like I need every dollar I, I can. So he's like, all right, I'll give you a free entry. Like on Facebook and stuff, like people were sharing my videos all over the world. It was going viral. And uh, he's like, I have, I have to have you there. I'm not going to like not have you over 200 bucks. So um, <laughs> the competition is on a Friday and a Saturday. And Sunday I'm supposed to dance at the stripper bar for the first time. So <laughs> I'm all ready to go, right? I go to the competition. I wind up doing incredibly well. And when it's over, I get all these job offers and such to work at people's gyms and all these things. So, unfortunately, I did not dance the next day. Oh, heartbreaker. <laughs> but it was, it, was, uh, it was on the radar, and it was something that was going to happen for sure. Wow. So, <laughs> I also got caught stealing one time, um, and I had to do 1,000 hours of community service. 1,000. So... That actually lasted – I was doing community service on the weekends for three years. Oh, wow. Maybe maybe four. Like it was a long time. Like a lot of people don't know this. I've actually never said this on a podcast yet. But um, I was I, – when I opened the gym, I coached every single class every single day before I had went to the 2014 regionals I think it was. So I was coaching 10 classes every day. I had two private clients that I coached every day for extra cash. So I'm coaching 12 hours a day. I was running the website. I was making all the workouts. I was doing everything that you'd have to do as a manager of a gym. I had no employees at all. And then I'd work on the weekends. And as soon as the weekend was up, I would run to the community service place and pick up garbage at parks for another like eight hours a day. Damn. For four years. <laughs> It was insane. And then um, I remember like trying to have a girlfriend at the time and like I'd always be like hiding on the weekends and she's like, where are you going? What are you doing? I don't understand. 
like you already work so much during the week. Like what could you possibly be doing right now? <clears throat> and I, I had to tell them all, which was embarrassing. And then, yeah, I mean, you, you had to tell them all your, your, your multiple girlfriends. <laughs> well, yeah. Cause you, you it's kind of hard to keep one at that time. <laughs> sure. Sure. I, I didn't know maybe they were all at the same time. One of them I never even told, you know, so I, I made it away with that one. But then the other, there was like two other ones I had, I had to tell them the truth. Well, that's a hell of a story. Dude, it was insane. So like, <laughs> even now the amount of work that I do, it just feels normal to me. Like I'm used to just having these ridiculous long days. And as soon as I get any time to myself, I'm like, all right, well, I'm gonna start working on like an ebook that I can sell or something. And even the, the travels that I do now, like, I don't know how much you've been following me, but I've on the weekends, I'll just like randomly get on an airplane, like on a Friday and I'll buy the ticket that Friday morning and I'll leave Friday night and I'll come back on a Monday or a Sunday night. So it's like a really quick weekend trip. Yeah. Um, so I, last year I went like all over the country snowboarding. Like I went to Utah, I went to Whistler in Canada, um, a bunch of different places like Idaho, all these crazy places just on the weekend and I'd come straight back, get back to work. I recently went to Banff in Canada. Ooh, that's on my, that's on my list. Whistler is one of my favorite places, but Banff I've not been to yet. Banff is insane. I've, I've heard. The lakes and the hikes are just unbelievable. Like it was, that's, besides like stuff from out of the country, man, I, I think Switzerland's my favorite place on earth so far. And I would say Banff is very, very similar. Like they have the, the green bluish water. Um, yeah. The mountains are like very rugged looking. They're not as massive as Switzerland, but they just have a really cool look to them. It's really peaceful. Like it's, it's, it's a very clean. Yeah. It sounds it, like it sounds amazing. amazing. Yeah. It's a beautiful place. And it's, to fly to Cal flying to Calgary is not really that expensive. Okay. It's a pretty cheap flight. All right. It's, it's moving up my list. Yeah. Now that's, that's awesome. It sounds, uh, it sounds like you live a intense life. I think would be an understatement. Yeah. I mean, my free time is always, I have a mountain bike, I have a road bike, I surf, hiking. I, I do everything for sure. Like as soon as I get any time, I'm always on something I can get hurt on and uh, <laughs> <laughs> trying to live my best life. Man, Kelly, Kelly Slater broke his, broke his foot. Oh, did he? Yeah. Yeah. Broke his foot recently just on a, like a closed out wave and the, uh, yeah, came back and just smashed his foot. And, oh, uh, man, it was, that is a bummer. Uh, if you like blood and gore, uh, Google the pictures. Oh, really? It's that bad? Yeah, it's it's pretty bad. It's oh, pretty wow. It's bad. Um, but uh, damn. Um, oh, all right. So you have real, in, you know, you have crazy story, intense, uh, intense lifestyle, of course. I can only imagine. I hate to see you in the gym. <laughs> I can only okay. imagine what that is like. Uh, well, what's some I, of back before I get you going on your personal workouts, which uh, nobody should probably attempt at home. What, what's what's some of your uh, your crazy advice that you like to spout off? You said people like listening into your podcast because usually you have some some things to say uh, as far as what people should follow and what people should do. What's uh, what are some of your favorite? your, your favorite things for fitness. Yeah. For fitness, for, for health, for nutrition, just, um, maybe, maybe the things that are most, uh, most radical, I would say. Yeah. I mean, I have some viral videos of me talking about like, if you want any gains in the gym, you, you have to deal with a lot of pain and it doesn't matter if you're a bodybuilder looking for extra reps or you're a CrossFitter looking to, you know, dig deeper in the pain cave and just get better at being in the pain cave and getting more reps in a certain period of time, you're going to have to deal with pain. And a lot of people, the reason that they don't have the body that they want or, or uh, you know, the performance that they want is because they're really just kind of being a pussy and they're just shying away from the pain, which is totally fine. Like we all get there and it's uncomfortable, but you have to be able to dive into that if you want to get the results that you want. And I also believe the same with nutrition. Like if, uh, if, if it's not hard to do the diet that you're doing, you're probably not going to get the results that you want. Like it's very easy to cave and, you know, have a vanilla latte with hundred grams of sugar in it or have, or sit there and watch your friend eat a muffin and 
you want to eat the muffin too. Like, I mean, that's, those are very easy things to cave in on, but, uh, it's, it's harder for the person to say no. And the person that says no all the time is probably a lot closer to the, that body that you want. Yeah. I always tell everybody every single thing that you put in your body should have a purpose. So like if you look at something like what is the purpose of that food or that beverage at that time? So it's, it's very rare that you're like, Oh, I deserve a hundred grams of carbs. Like unless you, <laughs> unless you just worked out, you don't deserve those carbs. If you just woke up in the morning, you probably don't deserve those carbohydrates. Um, even on like a cheat meal day, like that should be like a day that you have saved and ready to go. It's not like, Oh, I can cheat like a little bit every single day or whatever. So I always tell everyone that like, just get ready to deal with some pain. That's going to be something that's going to help push you to the different levels of your fitness that you never really thought that you were ever going to have. And then as far as food goes, make sure everything that you eat has a purpose. I like, I like the purpose uh, driven stuff that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I'm I'm curious what your cheat days look like. Are they as insane as everything else? Yeah. So like when I cheat, <laughs> it's like ten donuts, not one. Yes. <laughs> and and like, you you that's that's just the way it is. And then you you just work it off the next day, or uh... well, it's there actually this this thing called like a refeed day, and it's actually good for your body to have these insane surpluses of calories. Sure. Um, cause it does boost your metabolism and it does kind of like fill a bunch of things in your body that have been maybe missing for the last couple of days or weeks, like as healthy, not as healthy, I shouldn't say, but like as beneficial as it is for you to have a lower carb diet to get leaner body fat. Yeah. There are some unhealthy things that correspond with it too. So you have these refeed days where you just have massive amounts of carb intake and it kind of. You're still getting the benefits of having a lower carb diet with the body fat, but you're also getting the benefits of eating carbohydrates, even though it's only one day. Sure. No, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's like what people do with uh, protein fasting. And then you have your your refeed days and uh, CrossFitters probably are not doing a ton of fasting or, or even intermittent fasting, depending on how hard you're training or if it's an off day or whatever, but, um, you definitely shouldn't if you're a competitor. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I, I'm not competing, so I, I love to, to go, you know, I just traveled back from, uh, from Thailand and I was like, all right, instead of eating shitty airport food, I'm going to fast. And I ended up fasting for 48 hours Woo! And it was the best <laughs> refeed ever. And yeah, I'm down, I'm down a couple pounds. I didn't touch any weights while I was over there. And, uh, you know, I ate Thai street food for a dollar and it was the best experience of my life. You know what I mean? Like it was, it was great. But the, the refeed, oh my God. Yeah. That yeah, was, that was glorious. 48 hours is a long time. Yeah, you you think you could? Uh, I mean, again, you don't want to do that uh, with the way you're training. But uh, you ever think about fasting or intermittent fasting at least? I thought about doing. There's like a there's a bunch of studies corresponding with the three day fast. Yeah, like how many things that does for your body, which I think would be interesting. And I've seen people do it who have like a significant amount of muscle mass, like myself, and they don't really seem to lose any. Yeah. Ah, oh, that would scare me. I don't know. Yeah, I'll I'll send you some stuff actually, um, because as I understand it, your so uh, autophagy where your the cell death right your the the basically the shitty muscle cells die off and let go when your body is able to detox flush itself out, and then your body is just waiting for that hit of calories you know for that hit of protein to refeed you know that's that's the point of of refeeding, but just take. I, I've even seen like uh, John Berardi now is programming a, a whole day. Uh, a lot of bodybuilders are are actually doing a twenty four hour fast every week. But you know, do that on a Friday, but then Saturday go all out, and uh, you're the uh, again the bad muscle cells uh, will die off, and then your body just creates new ones and, and you see even better gains. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's some interesting research out there. I think the biggest thing for like the three day fast for me would just be not being able to work out. That would be kind of rough. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as a, as a skinny guy who has 
worked for every bit of muscle mass, I'm like, at first I was like, oh no, I can't, I can't do this. I can't afford to skip a meal. And, um, but yeah, cognitively I felt better and, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. I've been messing around with it for a little while. I did like the intermittent fasting for a while, like where I wouldn't eat until like one mm -hmm. when I woke up, but I started losing so much weight. I just had to stop. Yeah. And you got to have the same amount of calories and if you need an insane uh, i don't know how many calories you're eating a day but uh it's a lot to get to get yeah. that into two meals right it's like impossible <laughs> yeah i can i can imagine impossible but it's it's more difficult than if i just like ate like regular for sure for sure when you're feeding all of the time uh, i usually eat like at minimum like 3500 calories a day so sure sometimes Sometimes a little bit more. It's, it really doesn't seem like that much, but I guess it kind of is. Yeah, and if it's if it's clean, healthy calories, um, I, I, yeah, I need thirty five hundred calories if I'm gonna gain any weight at all. Um, and it's not easy to get if you're if you're eating in a healthy manner. Um, for yeah, for me personally, if you have a high fat diet, I feel like it's not too bad because you're getting nine calories per gram, right? But if you're eating like a high carb, high protein diet, and like a low fat, which is like a lot of bodybuilders, that's hard to do. Yeah. You gotta eat a ton of carbs and protein. That's, it's crazy. Yeah, when I would track <laughs> my calories, like with the uh, chronom uh, chronometer, chron chronometer, whatever, um, you know, and you put, you insert everything that you eat into the app, et cetera, counts your calories. Uh, when I was really heavy on the fats, and especially the saturated fats, so dense in calories, so easy to consume that I would say, oh, uh, like this is eat. Oh, let me, oh, I'm not hitting my, my calories yet. Let me just go eat some crackers, like some gluten-free crackers and ghee, right? You're going to, you're going to put on the, the calories yeah. pretty quickly. Uh, but I try to watch my saturated fat, um, a little bit more than I, than I was previously just because I don't know, I, in my genetics, I can see that, um, I'm susceptible, susceptible to certain things when I, I'm on a high fat diet. And so I don't know, it doesn't seem like the healthiest thing just to be. It's weird. Cause like some people get shredded on like uh, on high carb diets and some people just doesn't work. Like for me, like as soon as I switch from high fat to high carb, I just get soft. Like sure. it doesn't, I can have low fat and high carb and I might feel fine too, but like, I just don't look that good. So for me, I eat like a crazy amount of fat and I just don't eat like that many carbs really at all. No. And it's about for anybody listening. It's about what works for them. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what would really you say? Yeah. What would you say with, with so much dogma out there and we've thrown out so many different tactics and strategies uh, that maybe have, worked for people in your world or, or people in my world, but what would you say so we can combat the dogma a little bit out there? I really like Rob Wolf's approach to this. So Rob Wolf, for those of you out there who don't know who that is, he's like a very famous like paleo speaker and he has books on the paleo diet and he's probably the first one to really get popular on the subject. But uh, he says to anything that is like you're potentially on the fence about or you know is like on the fence in in all of these like food um, allergy type of things. So like for instance, like for me, like I, I have – I drink a latte like every day. Not like a sweetened one, just a regular whole milk latte. There's no sweetener in it. it, it it's probably – I don't know. There's probably 10 grams of just milk sugar in there, right? Maybe. But – um. I do fine with milk. Like I'm totally fine with it. I've taken it out. I've put it back in a million times and I feel fine. I don't feel like I'm leaner without it. Nothing. I switched to black coffee for months on end, weeks on end. I've even stopped drinking coffee. It doesn't make a difference. It's the only milk that I have ever. <clears throat> um, but for some people, they might drink milk and they're like toast. But you don't even know how you feel unless you take it out. Sure. What Rob Wolf says is take out anything that's borderline, anything that you could potentially have an allergy to, take all of it out. So you're basically just eating meat and vegetables. Do that for a whole month and then for like a couple of days, add in oatmeal and see how you feel. 
take that away. If you don't really feel like anything's happening, you can maybe leave it in and then add milk, see how you feel. Um, I'm still a big fan of like go 30 days meat and vegetables and fruit and nuts, like basic things. Even nuts though or have allergy kind of effects. So maybe just meat, vegetables, and fruit. Add in like almonds, take them out. Add in cashews, take them out. Like try different things just for like a few days and don't keep eating the other thing. Just completely change it out. And then try oatmeal for a few days, take it out. And then try milk for a few days, take it out. And just see if you feel different at all. Like there's, for me, oatmeal, I can feel like immediately. I'm like, whoa, that was a, not a good idea. Like, and it's weird, but, and I would never have known that if I didn't take it out ever. Wow. So because everyone is so much different, um, I think it's, it's imperative that every single person try that. I mean, Rob Wolf says that every single person on earth, everyone is gluten intolerant to some degree. That's really interesting. Right. So whether it's a very, very small percent or you're like extremely intolerant to the point where you have like celiac disease, like that's a possibility, but you don't even know any of that until you take it out and try. Um, so I think that's very, very important. Charles Poliquin, he's the biggest strength conditioning coach name probably out there. Unfortunately, he passed away like the last couple of weeks. Um, he says a lot of people from Europe actually don't, they don't do very well with carbohydrates. They, they, they do better on a higher fat um, diet than most people from America. Interesting. Like on average, like all, cause he's, he's, uh, he has like over 120 Olympic medals from people he's, that he's trained. And he's like, he, his goal is to get every single person down to enough body fat where you can see all of their abs. Wow. So he tells every athlete, they're not allowed to have carbohydrates until you can see your abs. And then once they, once he can see your abs, he starts playing with your diet a little bit more. And he was saying the ones that would eat carbohydrates and get puffy really fast were like mainly like Europeans. And then the people in America, they would add carbs in it in like a lower fat diet and they were fine. Interesting. Interesting. Because I know like uh, in Europe, there is actually like the uh, the bread and stuff is way better. Yeah, it's way better. It's there's not it's not so genetically modified. The, the, there's better standards on pesticides, uh, herbicides, all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, you could pro an American could probably go over there and have a baguette in France and feel a lot better than if they walked down to Stop and Shop and uh, you know ate a loaf of bread. But yeah, for sure. but yeah, I don't know. A any idea why that is? That's interesting. Yeah, I don't know. He's saying it's something like in your genes, where basically when you're on that side of the world, like I guess certain things happen at a certain period of time and. Hmm. Just kind of is the way it is. I don't remember exactly how he put it, but he was just saying like literally every single um, like religious background or what I don't what would you what do you oh like nationality sorry sure every like nationality just has like you know they're differently different sections of like susceptibility to absorbing carbohydrates versus fats right I think it's super interesting and he right. said it helped it helped him a lot when it came to like making diets for certain athletes. Huh. You, you ever do any genetic testing on yourself? I have not. I really want to. But I've heard that like a lot of the tests that you get, because I wanted to get the one that you can order on Amazon. I forget which one it's called, but it's only like a $100 take-home test. Okay. And it gives you all of the foods you're allergic to. Mm -hmm. But for most people that I know who've taken it, it, it gives you the foods that you're most allergic to or the foods that you eat the most. So like – if you eat a lot of almonds and yeah. you eat a lot of like fish, it says you're allergic to fish and almonds because you eat a ton of it. Yeah. As I'd want to get, there's another test like from like a doctor that you can get that's a little more expensive, but it's supposed to be a lot more accurate. But even so, I heard that your, your, um, all of your allergies change like year to year. Yeah. I, I was talking about like, uh, genetics, like 23 and me, where you get to test your genome and see, uh, oh, that, no, I have not done that either. Yeah. I've done the allergy testing and I had the same shit come up. It was like, oh, you're allergic to, uh, coconuts and coffee and, uh, turmeric and stuff that I eat every single day. And I was like, 
Yeah. I really don't think so. I think I feel great on these things. And then I started looking into it and it was like, yeah, because your body actually produces, uh, I don't know if it's antibodies, um, but produces the things in your body that it, this test is designed to actually detect. So yeah, I, no, I was talking about like, uh, the genetics testing that can tell you, Hey, um, you know, your body is not designed so much to process alcohol or your body, you may be, uh, intolerant to dairy, which is what I found out, um, through my genetics. I didn't have to find that out through genetics. My mom and my brother are gluten in, or, or sorry, are, uh, Lactose. intolerant yeah or lactose intolerant so i should have just figured oh if they are i probably am uh i should cut this out and i'll feel, feel better but no of course for thir the first 30 years of my life i ate dairy because my dad's from wisconsin and that's what you do uh and then i you know i get a test and they're like oh yeah you should try this you'll feel better my skin cleared up and way less inflammation uh anyway yeah uh the genetic stuff is is pretty interesting there was a ton of girls in my gym who took dairy out and all all of a sudden their skin is like beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean you can you're you're less congested, um, you can breathe better, a whole yeah, whole less yeast infections for women. I know that. Um yeah, whole whole list of things. Uh anyway, Ryan, before before we wrap up, I I know you have some hardcore advice as far as like, hey, uh if you want the gains, get in the pain cave, right? Or, hey, here's what Rob Wolf says. Uh, I, I believe he was a science or a science, a uh, cancer researcher before he started doing what he's doing today. So really, really smart guy. And but he says something fairly radical where take cut out everything and just add one thing at a time. That sounds like hell to a lot of people who are listening right now. But what can you leave them about discipline because it sounds like you have that uh, pretty under control in your life. I just feel like anything hard is worth doing. You know what I mean? Like even a cold shower, I take a cold shower in the morning and like every time I get in the shower in general, I do like warm for a little bit, like not even hot. Like it's just like a little bit warm and then I put it on freezing cold and mentally I'm like, most people can't do this. Yeah. And I just, it's, it's a small win like right away. And then like when I'm eating and I'm, you know, opting out of getting the donut with my friend, like I know that he can't do it. And then like every time that you do something, you know that someone can't do, it just makes you feel that much stronger. And I just feel like it's really important to feel strong in your life. And it's really important to feel like you can say no to things. Because yeah. otherwise you're just a pushover and it's sad <laughs> in my opinion. Excellent. Like I, if you're that easy, then you're never going to get anywhere with Beautiful. anything. Beautiful. Well, uh, well said, Ryan, where can people uh, connect with you if they want to get involved with what you're doing, listen to your podcast, uh, reach out to you on social media, where can they find you? So if you check me out on Instagram, it's Ryan Fish, R-Y-A-N-F-I-S-C-H. Ryan Fisher was not available. So <laughs> at the time. Um, if you watch my stories on there and you just follow me along on Instagram, you'll see pretty much everything, everything else in my life is like in my little highlights in my Instagram. So pretty much everything is available on there. If you want to follow the gym, it's CrossFit chalk, just the way it sounds. Um, and yeah, like all my podcasts are on my Instagram. You can follow the shrugged collective, but you can get them all on my Instagram and yeah, it's pretty much where everything's at. Sounds good, man. Well, thanks for being on. I really appreciate it. Of course.